Can you believe in LA today? Because Brown tomorrow? I think we can see what's uh, Because we're gonna we're gonna watch one of these review videos after we kind of talk for a little bit. Um, we're gonna watch it post class. Don't worry, I'll make it interesting by stopping and talking also. So you don't like to fall asleep. It's Escobar. Escobar is good. Escobar is good. Well, we've had a couple bad ones. That one lady on the first novel unit was remarkably useless, but most of the others have been fine. 
So I got Alex and no one else so far. I guess I could stop the music now. Alex, why are you the only one here? Because the third bell link on the Google Classroom post is still second bell. Really? I had to go to the one from... Oh, crap. I messed up the link, you guys. Hold on. I got to do some damage control here. All right. I will... Thank you for figuring that out and telling me. No, no, stay here. Let me transfer it. Okay, they should slowly be figuring out, hopefully. I am recording this. I'm sure every single person who's not here will watch the recording. So say hi. Hi, everybody who's not here watching this later. Hello. Right. They all watch it, right? <laughs> I'm talking to nobody. Thank you. 
it's right up her alley. Did you see my note about Bernard? Yeah, like Bernard, Bernard. <laughs> yep. So it's like at this point, like who are you rooting for, right? At some point, at some point, John probably, right? Like. Oh, that's a great scene. Did you finish that scene, like the end of it? And Bernard like almost chickens out and then he, and then he saves face at the last second. He's like, well, yeah, why shouldn't I be? Yeah. Hemholtz is a pretty cool character. He's like really, really smart and actually has his head and heart in the right place where we're sympathetic to him. And, Somewhere in her, she wants to break out of the system, but she doesn't have the guts. You read that too, Ashley? No. Oh. Yeah. I mean, she was the one all the way back in the beginning of the book that was insisting on being monogamous with someone, which is like, oh my God, you know. Is everybody gonna read Brave New World now? <laughs> I was really hoping a few more people at home were gonna join in. Trying to be patient here. Well, here at the single Brave New World Revisited, which is kind of like a follow up, but it's not really a novel. I've never read it, but. What's different about that book is instead of like most dystopia books where everybody's freedom to enjoy themselves is taken away, here it's like all your vices become mandates, right? Like you're supposed to take these drugs all the time. You're supposed to have sex with everybody all the time. You're supposed to you're supposed to relax over half of your waking hours, right? So on the surface, that to a lot of people would kind of sound great, but then it doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah, so it's a pretty interesting way of making a dystopia. So you're a rebel if you want to be sober and monogamous. Maybe he's maybe he's like admitting some weaknesses in his character. That's what I think. All right. I guess we should do what we're going to do here. All right. So uh ap classroom videos you have the last set of 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 the short videos that are that are requirement to watch you want to do notes on those and those are helping you prepare for the frq on the novel and we want to have those done by sunday night we won't really have a class bell to really talk about that stuff so you really want to pay close attention because we only have two more classes after today monday's the mcq and thursday's the frq and wednesday won't happen because of the summa thing so we're down to the last couple times we'll meet. Uh, okay, so your third of four reader's log assignments ha has been graded. I did that over cohort time. Um, and those are, they're, they're mostly really great, you guys. So keep up the hard work. Um, and to really dig deep on the end of the novel, I know we don't have a ton of time because you've got a lot of stuff, you know, you're under the, under the, you're in the big crunch with a lot of stuff, but there is an extra credit opportunity if you look on the assignment post for you to do up to five extra reader's logs 
literary criticism based. So that's real work, okay? You don't have to do any more than four if you don't want to, or if your grade is already a solid A, or you're satisfied with a solid B, or if you don't care if you get a C. Um, but if you're kind of on the borderline and you want some extra cushion, then uh, that might not be a bad idea. Okay. Um, oh, here's Alex. Yep. No, you don't have to do creative choice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. No, you have to have more fun, actually. <laughs> Quit trying to be so intellectual. <laughs> All right. Alex, hi. I'm on, uh, just finished talking about number two. Hopefully you saw the extra credit opportunity on the last batch of readers' logs. Uh, three, so I think I already talked about this. Uh, MCQ on Monday. I, I'm realizing that's the Monday after prom weekend. I hope you guys don't resent me for that, but prom's on Friday, right? So, I mean, it's not as big of a deal. It's not like you have to spend hours studying for this or something. So, am I a villain? I'm just wondering if I'm a villain. Am I a villain? <laughs> it's, it's not like you have a ton of homework or something. It's just that you're coming back Monday and you have a test, right? Okay, all right. You don't hate me, I promise. Not any more than you did before. Okay, and uh, again, no class Wednesday, Thursday is the FRQ. Um, and finally, AP Daily's uh, review. I've talked enough about these, but I figured we could watch a good part of one together in class. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take a break halfway between and probably pause it a few times. But you know, this one is actually really, really good info. I mean, I know I always say that, but it completely breaks down the, uh, the rubric for the essays, no matter what kind it's for. And so that's a good thing. Uh, to watch. So I'm going to go over to AP Classroom. I'm going to start my screen share over because I have to indicate share sound, which I always forget. Hi, Ms. Reggie. Want to say hi? We're about to watch one of those extended AP review things. Yeah, all right, I mean, yeah, they're good. Uh, it's We've had several people through the course of the year, but the review ones are coming back to the original couple that, that did them last year and they did the early ones this year. So it's good. No, the ones, the ones who made, oh, we've had a whole bunch of different ones through the course of the year. But the ones who made the first few this year are the same ones who did it last spring. All right, so if you guys look at that schedule, the first one is review the components that make up the effective essay, but look at the other ones here. I mean, this is all, you know, oh, you don't see that. Oh, I, oh, all right, let me try that again. I never get that right. I go to hit share sound and then I forget which screen to select. How's that, is that better? Okay, so these are all hyperlinks. The first one's about the writing rubric. The second one is uh, how to move beyond reading for plot to reading for more complex levels of meaning. Third one's about brainstorm and argument of thesis with the claim, blah, blah, it's all good stuff. Okay, so I already watched this first one. I'm gonna go into it. Make sure you can see. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. Skip the ad in a sec here. This sentence is grammatically correct. Function and you're Okay, go back it up to the beginning. Okay, we're back. Are you hearing Mr. Escobar? Okay, all good. With AP Live this year. And, you know, if you're like me, as soon as your teacher says, it's time to write an essay, you get nervous and you break into a sweat. You're absolutely normal if this happens to you. But because you're here today, I bet that you're going to know exactly what to do in a few weeks when it's time to write your AP essay. So let's remember that you're normal if you're nervous, but you're absolutely fabulous if you're here with us today, because that means that you're going to have an edge. So you're going to tell all your friends to come over and watch all these videos. Today, we're going to talk about what exactly constitutes an essay. And you might be thinking, well, I've been sitting in AP the entire year. Don't I know what an essay looks like? 
I know you do, but it's time to review. It's also time for us to understand what the scoring guidelines tell us. And that's, that's exactly what we're going to do today so that we can distinguish between what are some of the good tips and tricks that our teachers have given us and what are the actual things that will earn us points on the AP exam. So we're going to go through the scoring guidelines. We're going to go over the parts of the essay and we're going to learn how to visualize the essay for success. Again, thank you for joining me. This is Mr. Escobar with you once again from Miami, Florida. Let's get started. So what are we going to learn? All right, well, we said we're going to learn about the parts of the essay. So the first question is, what constitutes an essay? Is it number of paragraphs? Is it the number of sentences per paragraph? Is it about length? Well, if we take it part by part, and if we ground ourselves on the scoring rubric, we don't have to ask ourselves this question anymore. We know exactly what it is that we're looking for. And we're going to start with the number one, the king of them all, the most important component, the thesis. And we're actually going to talk about thesis for a long time today, because if we understand not just what a thesis is, but the value of the thesis, because if we do all the right things when it comes to our thesis statement, we're not going to be staring at a blank sheet of paper. We're going to have developed a blueprint for our essays way before we actually start writing our essay. That's the trick. That's why you're here today. Once we have our thesis statement, well, we know what our topic sentences are gonna be because each of our body paragraphs is connected to our thesis statement. I like to think of the thesis and these topic sentences as promises. My thesis statement is, I promise that this essay will be about X and Y and Z. So then my topic sentences are promises about what my paragraphs are going to be about, X, Y, and Z. So if you think about having written an introduction and we have a thesis, now we have the blueprint for what each of our body paragraphs are going to be about. And we know that in each body paragraph, we have to have evidence. We have to have quotations. After all, how did we come up with the ideas that we put into our thesis? Well, as we were reading the passage or the poem or the novel or the play, we identified really important parts of the text. We probably highlighted them or circled them or, or, or made notes of these. And that's what led us to our ideas. But evidence alone is not important because I want to know exactly what you think the importance of that evidence is. And aside from our thesis statement, I really want to focus on commentary. These two parts of an essay are crucial to maximizing our success on every essay that we write for AP English Literature and Composition. So let's review. And if we're going to review, we're not going to talk about terminology. I want to go to the scoring guidelines. Because this is, you know, a lot of people say, Once again, <laughs> for the benefit of people at home who couldn't hear me, um, you realize that all this is just like the regular five paragraph essay that you've been taught for a long time, right? It's a thesis, it has a main point, it has three supporting points, those, are your li those form your line of reasoning and each one becomes a body paragraph, which is a claim, which is led by a topic sentence, it's all the same thing. But what's insisted upon by the AP rubric and by me and the way that I grade is that the main point can't be this generic thing that maybe we've done before. It can't just repeat, and he's going to talk about this too, it can't just repeat. You know, some of you guys think you're not just repeating the prompt, but you really are, okay? You can't just say there's a complex relationship there. You have to characterize the complex, a complex relationship of showing this or that about the characters and about maybe humanity in general. If you don't get that in there, you're not going to get that thesis point. 
Okay. What are the secrets? What are the secrets? How do we beat this test? Well, it's not about beating a test. It's about learning skills. It's about understanding how it is that we communicate in essay form. And the scoring guidelines will give us the rubric, or sorry, the, the, the template, the blueprint for what it is that's expected of us. We're looking at row A here. Row A is dedicated to thesis. Remember when I told you the thesis is the most important part? Well, it's no surprise then that row A is dedicated to the thesis. You're going to see two columns, zero points and one point. Let's see what it is that we need to earn the one point. Our essay responds to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible interpretation of the poem. Our thesis presents a defensible interpretation of the poem. Mr. Escobar, I've heard my teacher mention this a bunch of times this year, but I still don't understand what that means. Well, that's okay. Why don't we do this? Let's look at the zero points. Let's look at what doesn't earn us the point when it comes to thesis. I specifically want to look at bullet number two and bullet number three, let's say. The intended thesis only restates the prompt. So let's pretend we have a prompt. Let's pretend we have a prompt where we are asked to analyze the complex relationship between A and B. And our thesis is A and B have a complex relationship. I want you to think about that. If the prompt asks us about the com zero out of one complex relationship of A and B, and your thesis states that A and B have a complex relationship, what have you contributed? What have you brought to this discussion? I want you to understand what an essay is. An essay is an opportunity for you to demonstrate what you know. You know, in the madness of the classroom, in the madness of an AP exam, in the madness of the world in which we live, how many times do you have the ability to grab your teacher and say, listen to me. I want to tell you everything that I'm thinking, and I want to show you how brilliant I am. Well, that's what an essay is. So if you tell me that A and B have a complex relationship, you haven't brought yourself into the equation yet. Because at that point, all you're doing is echoing the prompt. The prompt which, by the way, was written by your teacher, was written by your professor, was written by you know, people at the college board. So why are you reminding these individuals of the prompt they wrote? You have to write yourself into it. So let's look at this complex relationship prompt, all right? You're all in relationship. You have a relationship with your parents. You have a relationship with your siblings, with your grandparents, with your friends, with your teachers, with your neighbor. Some of you might have a boyfriend or girlfriend. So if I were to ask you, Comment on your relationship. How would you describe your relationship? Give me some adjectives that shed light on what your relationship is like. You might tell me we have a healthy relationship, a chaotic relationship, a relationship um, based on trust. We have a relationship of equals. We have a uh, contentious relationship. Right? Regardless of how you describe your relationship, that's gold. That is the answer. That's where you bring yourself into the equation. So do not simply restate the prompt. The other thing that we don't want you to do is to simply provide a summary of the issue. I don't want you to just talk about relationships. Everyone has relationships and these relationships can be very complex and they can be uh, good or bad, happy or sad. You're talking in general terms but you're not really looking at the relationship between A and B and stating why it is that their relationship is complex. So what is a defensible interpretation? Wait, well, defensible interpretation is now your interpretation, your opinion of this relationship, which must now be defended. So what do we mean by defensible? Well, we mean we need you. We need you to show us two things. 
we need you to show us what parts of the text led you to that interpretation. And then we need you to explain why those parts of the text were significant, which happens to be a great segue to row B. Row B of the scoring guideline is all about evidence and commentary. Now, whereas row A solely focused on thesis, row B is a little more complicated. And I want us, even though it's one row, I want us to uh, pretend that there's a line here in the middle, separating all the information about the evidence from the evidence about commentary. I'm also not going to focus on zero points because you're past that. You're way past that at this point. I want to start at one point, and I want us to look across this row solely looking at evidence, OK? Provides, to earn one point, provides evidence that is mostly general. So you don't necessarily have direct quotations. You might say, in Hamlet, somewhere in Hamlet, Hamlet contemplates whether he should live or not. Well, I don't know what Hamlet said. I don't know where this took place. So that, that's what I mean by general evidence. But let's move on to two points. Provides some specific relevant evidence. So you're probably going to have some of those general comments. But now you're also saying, well, in Act 2, Scene 3, we find this quotation, and you quote it. Right, so it's going to be a mix between general and specific. I want you to look at three and four points. Look at the criteria for those two. They're exactly the same. You provide specific evidence to support all claims in a line of reasoning. So let's pause right there. Let's make sure we understand the language. Provide specific evidence. And I think now we understand what specific evidence means, right? We're going to quote or situate text in a specific spot. Right? It doesn't have to be a direct quote. You could also talk about, you know, in the opening chapter of The Awakening. That's pretty specific if you're going to talk about the parrots or you're going to speak about what's going on with the characters at that point. But if we continue reading, it says to support all claims in a line of reasoning. This is where it gets a little more complicated. All claims. If we go back to what we first started talking about, we open with a thesis. Right? In our introduction, hopefully in our introduction, we have a thesis. And within that thesis, we list some of our ideas. And each of these ideas become a different body paragraph. So each of those body paragraphs will be a small claim. If your thesis is your large claim, now each body paragraph is a small claim. And remember what I said about evidence? Evidence exists to support these smaller ideas that you have, these components of the thesis. So we need every single body paragraph to have specific evidence, specific quotations, specific sections of the text that support whatever you're arguing at that moment. Now, I, I, I understand that we're speaking also about best case scenario. Sometimes you're not too sure what your thesis will be, or sometimes you change your thesis, and that's okay. You can go back, you can make changes, and as you change your thesis, Yep. You might have to change some of your topic sentences or the angle of some of your body. Of the Zoom? OK, I'll get you back in. Paragraphs. I don't want you guys, I, I, I don't want you students to, to mistake the task at hand. The task is to write a draft. We're not asking any of you to write the perfect essay. I couldn't write the perfect essay in 40 minutes. Neither could your teacher probably. In 40 minutes, if I'm reading a poem, if I'm reading a passage, if I'm dealing with a novel that I wasn't even sure what the prompt was going to be before that moment, the best I can give you is a solid draft. And that's what we're looking for. So it's okay if you have to amend certain things as you go along. But let's understand the criteria. 
So the evidence has to be specific and we have to have evidence in every body paragraph because we have to support all of our claims. So now let's deal with the second half of this row when we go to commentary. What exactly is commentary? What does it look like? What purpose does it serve? To earn one point, here the criteria reads, it summarizes the evidence, but does not explain how the evidence supports the student's argument. If we say that Hamlet is a deep thinker, and we provide evidence, we say to be or not to be is something that Hamlet thinks about. And then we say, to be or not to be means, should I live or should I die? Well, all you've done is paraphrased the quotation. You, you've given me your summary of the quotation, but I need more from you. I need to understand out of all the words in Hamlet, Hamlet is Shakespeare's longest play. And of all of Shakespeare's characters, Hamlet is the one who speaks the most. So out of all these words at your disposal, you chose to be or not to be. Why? Why is that phrase so central to your argument? And that's what commentary is. Commentary is not summary. Commentary is a discussion of the significance of the evidence. So if you're going to give summary, you're living in that one point range. So let's move across. Let's go to two points. Explains how some of the evidence relates to the student's argument, but no line of reasoning is established or the line of reasoning is faulty. You know, sometimes we provide evidence and, you know, it's a good quotation and we do a good job at talking about the significance of that quotation, but we're not tying it back to our thesis. We're not tying it back to our topic sentence. It's like, after I hear you tell me the significance of to be or not to be, now I understand that quotation much better, but I still don't understand how that quotation fits this argument, this claim, this essay. To do that, we need to move into the three and four range where it says explains how some of the evidence supports a line of reasoning. And for four points, it says consistently explains how the evidence supports a line of reasoning. Again, we need to visualize. We have a thesis. Our thesis will have literary devices. It's going to have some of our ideas. And out of all this information that we have in our thesis, we build our body paragraphs. We open our body paragraph with a topic sentence. We have evidence, and now we're looking at commentary. If every body paragraph will have evidence, every body paragraph will have your commentary. Every body paragraph will have your discussion of how that evidence ties to the thesis, your discussion of how that evidence ties to the topic sentence. Again, we want you to be involved. We want to hear your voice it's time for you to shine. It's time for you to share your intellect with the world. You're grabbing the college board by the collar and saying, listen to me. I've sat for a year in this course and I have something to say. And guess what? If you're not sure what to say, just fake it, right? Confidence, confidence and an understanding of the try different not, parts try not to of do the that. essay. And you're going to execute this perfectly. Look at the little comment here at the bottom of three points and four points explains how at least one literary element or technique in the poem contributes to its meaning explains how multiple literary elements or techniques in the poem contribute to its meaning you know those techniques that you've talked about probably since middle school right you know what a metaphor is personification a simile you know that a poem, for example, is made up of lines and stanzas of varying lengths. You know that writers choose their words very carefully and they create imagery and, and the collection of all these things convey a tone as well. Well, how do all these devices come together to convey, let's say, the complex relationship? Let's not forget these 
terms. As a matter of fact, the scoring guideline is saying that for you to maximize the points, you need to explain how multiple literary elements or techniques in the poem contribute to the poem's meaning. I have been a little bit easy with you guys on this um, because it's not absolutely necessary to talk about it all the time and you don't want to turn your essay into something where you're, you definitely don't want to just spend time defining what literary devices are. I've had a few of you like uh, spend two or three sentences like defining what imagery is or defining what personification is. There's no need to do that. That's like wasted energy. Okay. Um, but to really get highest on the rubric, you definitely want to have, you know, even if it's really broad ones like characterization or use of setting or something like that, or even plot as far as how it relates to, you know, clashing values and systems and, and, and things like that, all those things tie together, but don't completely avoid, you know, using literary term. It should be sprinkled through there. And, and, you know, if not part of your line of reasoning, then sprinkled throughout in other ways. Here's why. We don't want, look, it's not about earning a three, a four, a five on an AP exam. That's not the end goal. Your end goal is life, right? Your end goal is to, to go to college, to go beyond college. Your end goal is to become a deep thinker, a careful reader, and an analytical thinker. But what that necessitates is for you to understand that everyone, every ad, Every TV show, every book, every speech is a manipulation, is a combination of words and phrases to achieve some sort of purpose or some sort of effect. So when we ask you to think about these literary elements or techniques, what we're asking you to do is prove to us that you understand how the message was put together and conveyed to you. So can you break it down? So I, I'm thinking every paragraph should have some literary element or technique being discussed. If you do that, then you're gonna ensure that throughout your essay, you will have discussed multiple, right? That's the, that's the key phrase there in that row, multiple literary elements and techniques. So that's a lot, right? We went over the scoring. Bathroom stretch break. See you in two, three minutes. This is Bell, you guys remember? 15? Okay. Trying to wait till Alex gets back. Or does she already have her camera off? I don't know. And here we go. Spring guideline 
which I'm sure you've done throughout the year, but, but let's say you haven't, right? It, it, some of the things that I've been saying probably sound very familiar. You know, there's different ways of arriving at what these essays should look like. So I don't want you to be frustrated if you're thinking, I haven't heard these words from my teacher. Well, don't, don't focus on the words. Think about the big picture, right? We have a thesis. We have body paragraphs. We have evidence. We have commentary. So let's look at an example. Let's visualize the essay. And let's recognize one thing. Remember, when we first started, I said that as soon as your teacher says, you're writing an essay today, you break into a sweat. Well, you break into a sweat because this is what you visualize. You visualize an empty sheet of paper. I would be nervous too, right? I would be nervous too. If I'm staring at this sheet of paper, I'm looking at the clock, and there's a clock right there, I'm looking at it, and the minutes are ticking away and nothing is happening. No wonder you're nervous, but that's not at all what's happening here, right? So how do we get to the point where you write the essay? How do we get to the point where you write the essay with confidence? And we stop staring at a blank sheet of paper because that's not healthy, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna forget words, okay? We're gonna forget words and let's deal with gibberish. Let's deal with gibberish just for a little bit, right? Because I don't want us to get confused with, well, what is it saying? How would I have said it? Let's just agree for one second that this is a thesis statement. Now, your thesis statement could be two sentences, right? It doesn't have to be one sentence, but let's just pretend that this is our thesis for the day. And remember how I told you that in your thesis statement, you might identify you should identify, you will identify literary elements and techniques and big ideas, right? Different aspects of your interpretation in response to the prompt. These are going to be in your thesis. And here I'm identifying them as what came in red and what comes here in green. Well, how did this come about? How did we arrive at the red portion and the green portion. Well, we were reading something, right? The exam will give you a poem. The exam will provide you with a prose passage. And for the open-ended question, it will tell you, choose something you've read, choose a novel or play that you've read, that you've studied. So how do we get to these ideas? Well, we were connected to the text. So if we were connected to the text, then that means that we already know the quotations that led us to those ideas. So look at what just happened. If we write a thesis statement where we stipulate different ideas or different literary techniques that we're going to discuss, and we think, well, what made me think of this literary technique? Or what made me think of this aspect of the complex relationship? You go back to the text and you identify those quotations. Well, then at that point, look at everything that we've got. We have a thesis. We have a topic sentence. Because the topic sentence will reiterate one aspect of the thesis. And we already knew which evidence or what evidence led us to that idea. So we have body paragraph number one. We have body paragraph number two. Now, I don't want you to read into this, right? Mr. Escobar is not telling you that an AP essay should only have two body paragraphs. In those 40 minutes, you can write three body paragraphs, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 body paragraphs. You go ahead. I'm eager to read this. I'm excited to see what your claims are and what your interpretation is. But this is just as an example. But look at that empty space. What, what have I not talked about? Well, we have our topic sentences. We have our evidence. Think about what's missing. What have we talked about today? What aspect of the scoring guideline did we look at that we don't have yet? Well, I can tell you this much. What we're not staring at is that a blank sheet of paper? If you read the poem, read the passage, really understand the prompt and dedicate yourself, make a vow right now that you're going to work on that thesis 
and, and you can work on that thesis, you know, on, on, on your prompt sheet, on a scrap sheet of paper, type it up, and then start the essay. Well, you're not working off a blank sheet of paper at that point. At this point, you have all of this already outlined. You have a blueprint, you have a stipulation for what this essay will be doing. And now, what do we have to focus on? Commentary, <laughs> all right? And that was pretty dramatic, but, but commentary is tough and I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, all right? But what we can do today is talk about what constitutes commentary? What are the different uh, angles that I can take as a writer in those blank spots where my commentary goes? Well, we go back to the scoring rubric, right? And, and we know that we were talking about evidence and commentary. And I wanna focus on the four points because I'm, I'm going for the gold, right? I wanna earn as many points as possible. So let's look at these two aspects right here. And I'm gonna stop it there because we're a few minutes from the bell. Thanks for sticking with me guys. I know you're probably burnt out at this point. Um, and I won't be here tomorrow. So you guys have a great time at prom if you're going. Have a great weekend and uh, I'll see you Monday for the MCQ.